Jim has led three separate lean transformations in uh, various executive roles. He's worked in the auto industry for 34 years, uh, having worked with Delphi Automotive. Since 2000, Jim has really focused on leadership coaching, uh, application of lean in R&D, and application of lean to software development. So we are located here in Indianapolis. Jim, you are calling in from Carmel, Indiana. Is that correct? So if I walked outside, I could, right. uh, I could likely throw a uh, stone and hit your home from here. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for being on yeah, with us right. here. And I'll go ahead and turn things over to you, Jim. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the first two presentations as much as I did, and I'm going to um, try to connect with both of them because they offered very good and insightful thoughts about lean and product development. <clears throat> my, view, my view is going to be a little different in terms of I'm going to take a look at it from a problem identification and problem solving perspective. And also, I'm going to deal with the culture of making change. So I am uh, in a group called the Lean Transformations Group. It's a small group of five people. Um, we are focused on trying to take Lean to this next level, reaching new heights, recognizing that in some cases it's been a flash in the pan with companies. In other cases, it's taken too long. There have been a lot of trials associated with it, so we're trying to understand that. And that we coach with deep dive problem solving, recognizing that <clears throat> problem solving is a key to this whole thing at all functions and all levels in an organization. And we are helping organizations guide toward making uh, culture change. I've had the opportunity of actually having some personal experience at making change of this type in companies along with um, being able to go into many companies and see the struggles that they're going through. Just so to start off with the PD landscape, <clears throat> these books right here are based on some direct connection to Toyota studies. Uh, it, uh, these, there are three people that fundamentally went into Toyota, into their product development of the four uh, authors of these books. And they came back and said, this is what Toyota is doing and in some way, shape, or form, put it into books. Jim Morgan, Alan Ward, and Derwood Sobeck are the three. And Michael Kennedy worked with Alan Ward um, on some books that really got into what is lean product development from the perspective of doing these studies. I had the opportunity to have Alan Ward as my sensei while I was trying to put this into Delphi as a director of engineering in Rochester, New York. So uh, my, my thoughts are founded from these fundamental studies. It's not to diminish what Catherine has done specifically because she too was attached to Alan Ward, but it came just a little later than some of these others. So I want to talk about <clears throat> a problem from the perspective of a cultural issue that we have. Uh, I'm going to talk about two paradigms, and these are organizational habits that have been created over time. You might think of the blanket solutions thinking on the left hand side is fundamentally the traditional cultural model that we live in, which is to throw solutions at problems quickly without really thinking about what is the problem I'm trying to solve and who do I get engaged in that problem and do deep problem solving with it. The other paradigm is the one that is has been developed inside Toyota for many, many years and seems to be fairly consistent, and that is problems are identified and they're solved in small rapid experiments so that the whole system is learning concurrently as time goes on. Uh, just a couple of thoughts about examples of this. If you think about leadership that we see, uh, the leaders tend to throw solutions at all kinds of problems, and these are the same solutions almost from all companies, and they include things like, well, let's change the organization. Let's have an organizational change is one blanket solution to solve some problem that's not well identified. Another one might be, well, let's just apply uh, reductions in headcount. Another one might be, let's do mergers and acquisitions, and so on. 
Another one is just let's put a new IT system in and that'll fix everything. So those are the kinds of solutions and we just accept these. These are organizational habits and we accept them. I think the best story I have with regard to solutions thinking or really kind of a program approach to lean is I worked in a small company and had six plant managers in this company uh, and taught them how to identify problems in each of their plants. What's the fundamental thing you want to fix and how do you go about and begin to fix that in a very careful problem solving method. And at the end of two days, four of the six were very happy. They knew how to go back to their plants and they decided they could in fact use this problem solving thinking to help them run their plants better. And two of them looked at their shoes and I, I wondered what was going on here. So two of the six couldn't really think about using a problem solving approach. So I asked what was going on and they said, well, our boss wants us to get a Shingo prize in two years. We don't have time to solve problems. So that's the kind of mentality I'm talking about. And somehow we just accept a solution. So the solution for that, that director of engineering was you get a Shingo prize and you will become good as opposed to really digging in and finding out what's going on, why aren't we serving our customers as Brian was talking about, value to the customer more effectively and what are the real problems that we have, how do we get a focus on those problems. So the culture uh, tends to, our culture tends to uh, reinforce solutions thinking and quick actions. So what are habits? Because that is really the culture. We live in a culture of habits. So um, two, two books to think about here. One is The Power of Habit and the other one is Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, we automatically put our habits into our inner brains. And I think the example I can have with this is when you first learned how to drive a car. Um, you were very conscious of everything going on in the car, on the road, the pedal, the the steering wheel, everything was in the prefrontal cortex, the conscious part of the brain. But over time, it moved to being more of an automatic response. In fact, two or three months after that, you could listen to the radio, talk to people, you could have several things going on, and you can get from home to work without thinking quite often. And what that is, is the brain's mechanism for moving things from a very conscious prefrontal part to something that's more automatic. And these are, in fact, our habits. So this cultural thing that I talked about on the previous slide, it's very deeply in our brain and how you go about and begin to think about making changes to that. Uh, we've got to figure out how to make that happen. So we have to address this lean PD from a problem solving perspective rather than just applying it. And we're going to apply lean principles without eliminating your current habits adds complexity. If in fact you don't think about these as being habits, you're probably just going to add more routines and work for the people in the organization. And the second part is applying lean PD principles across the entire organization usually doesn't create an involvement of uh, problem solvers. So if I go back to what is lean, and this is looking at lean through the eyes of Steven Spears way back in 2005, and he said, what sets operations at Toyota Park is tightly coupling the process of doing the work with the process of learning to do it better, kind of at the same time, while it's being done. And it's a mindset that we don't typically have in our uh, cultures inside companies. If you're in product development, think about, are you really expecting your engineers in a product development process to design the product and pay attention to the process of the design and improve it at the same time? The answer is, of course not, we don't do that. We just expect them to do it and somebody else is going to redesign the process. The second part is operations are expressly designed to reveal problems. Now, in fact, product development should and in many cases is a process for revealing problems because it's a learning process and we have to answer the questions that we don't have answered. And the third thing Thing that set Toyota apart is that the managers are constantly developing their subordinates problem solving cup, uh, capabilities. So there's an intent from a manager point of view to give a problem, to deploy a problem to someone and say and look at that and coach that employee on how to do that more effectively. So 
the books that I referenced before don't really expressly deal with this. It's more of a solutions oriented or a principles approach to product development. It's not how do you really build these kinds of capabilities in your organization. So the question is how can we begin to create the problem solving habits in our product development value streams? And the first is use an effective problem solving process to define the problems with your current problem product development value stream. So what I'm going to suggest here is that we clearly understand what's wrong with our product development and we focus efforts on fixing those one or two or three things that are fundamentally wrong with it. And the second part is we need to engage with one or a few project teams to experiment with these principles that will address the problem defined. Let me talk first about a very high level about what is product development. Product development is a value stream that creates knowledge. It is, in fact, trying to get questions answered, unknown th things answered, and that is how do we grow it, how do we reuse it, how do we do it fast, and how are we doing it efficiently and effectively. And I'm talking about the knowledge creation part of product development. A little bit different look at it is a value stream look, and that is if you think about product development value stream, you start with say a product strategy and it goes into a product development value stream and it creates knowledge. That's the product development value stream. It should be done concurrently where you're taking inputs from and engagement from understanding the customer's needs, the manufacturing's needs, the supplier's needs and technical products needs and some more. So this has an implication that the product development value stream should be learning concurrently and in parallel rather than sequentially. So some product development value streams I've seen start with an understanding of the customer and it's thrown over the wall to product development and they do something and then they throw it over the wall to manufacturing. So it really implies you've got to do these things concurrently so you can learn as fast as possible. And then it delivers that knowledge in documents to the operations value stream. So the next in line customer for product development is manufacturing or your operations. And all of that knowledge that's been gathered shows up on product specs and test specs and other documents that you hand off. So one of the ways of looking at what's wrong with product development is let's take a look at that handoff to your next internal customer. Uh, one more thing is that as you go through that, it all should feed back and and um, provide additional value as you go through multiple product developments. So let's define the performance problem. What's the problem with your product development value stream? One way to do that is again to look at the handoff from uh, product development to manufacturing and say at this point what's wrong? What do I need to fix? Before you start thinking about getting into the product development process and suggest chief engineer or concurrent or even uh, uh, fast cycles of learning. So you ask these questions, who's the customer, what do you deliver, how do you measure it? In fact, I'll tell you most product developments don't have a good handle on the measurement of that delivery point. <clears throat> and some typical for performance problems are quality, timing, cost, customer satisfaction, and clarity specifically on what's wrong with your product development value stream is important so you've got something to anchor your lean product development efforts on. I'll suggest to you the ones that I've seen, there are two fundamental problems. One is there is a quality handoff problem which results in engineering changes that you spend a lot of time with fixing either the product or the process or other things uh, after it's been launched into manufacturing. So there are quality issues and there certainly is timing issues almost all product developments, the complaint is it just takes too long because the lead time it takes to go from start to finish is too long. So, but get more specific about who, what, where, and how does that take place at that delivery point. That's the first point in defining a problem is to define the performance problem. The second step in defining a problem is to get inside the value stream and say what is wrong, where are the contributing areas that are leading to my performance problem of product development. And basically, and Catherine uh, was 
is suggesting that we need to do the learning up front, which is true. So, uh, at least in my experience, that learning takes should take place before execution. You really need to get all your fundamental questions answered concurrently up front. So the typical contributing areas are in the learning chunk. It's happening too late. It's not cross-functional. Um, it's uh, too slow. It's task-based, and it's not question-based. Lots of tasks are being done that you're not fundamentally asking, what is it that I need to know about this product? In the execution phase, there's a lot of rework. Sometimes there's in ineffective management of suppliers and a lot of unclear roles and responsibilities. Those are just some ideas, but the intent here is, once you define your own personal performance problem, you've got to dig back and say, what's wrong with my product development process in learning and in execution? So in the learning area, um, look for high leverage areas for changing learning. So I'm just suggesting if, if we want to split the problem into those two halves, there are some things you can do to create learning better up front, and that is select a team, just get started, uh, create cross-functional teams, build a process of fast learning, build a discipline of PDCA or Lambda, and move from managing tasks to answering fundamental questions, as opposed to just managing the tasks. And then make phase reviews flexible in terms of creating knowledge. And then select principles from the lean books that I suggested on how to do effective problem solving, set-based concurrent design, trade off curves, whatever it is, begin to experiment with how you can learn faster up front and use questions to drive that process. So that would be one potential place to take a look at fixing uh, the, the contributing areas of problem, product development. Uh, Catherine uh, talked about fast cycles of learning, and I'm just going to go through with it. It should be cross-functional. Uh, it should have some form of a regular cadence, and it should be based on and driven by the questions you want to get answered in the upfront learning. If you focus on the execution phase, again, you can select a team uh, and build some kind of a feedback system uh, for the quality issues at the handoff. So you would be building what's called a cybernetic system, which has a knowledge creation value stream that is utilizing the problems associated with the delivery point or the quality issues and feeding it back to fix the fundamental value stream that you're a part of. So you would look at existing engineering changes, for example, and find what's wrong, put them into categories, and then drive to the, what are the root causes of the product development value stream that created that in the first place. So it will be giving you the feedback to help you figure out how to continually improve your product development value stream. And the second part is I will suggest to you that uh, because we're so solutions oriented, we've lost somewhat of the art of effective problem solving. And the two parts down here, problem definition and problem breakdown, are often skipped over on almost everything we do. So the suggestion would set be pick this area, make sure you have effective problem solving methods in place so that you can build that consistently across your product development organization and in fact across your entire organization. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how you really do change these habits. And this kind of gets back to an approach toward building a culture that is in fact focused on problems and solving problems all the time, just like the Toyota model that we saw um, before. So Terry Crews is an American actor. Uh, you may have seen him on Brookline Nine on TV. He plays in New York, um, sergeant, police department sergeant, and he's been in some things uh, like um, Old Spice commercials and uh, Becoming a Millionaire and some other things. So he, he was a football player uh, before he got into TV, and he, he actually was with four different NFL teams, but he managed to really stay in shape. And, uh, in terms of his habit, he says there are three things. Most people try to do too much when they start, and they make 
ex and he suggests that you don't do that. You try to make it a nice small experiment of going to um, some place to work out. And um, I'm seeing a note that says I'm experiencing network difficulty conditions. I don't know if you've got that or not. Make it enjoyable and start small and grow. And those are really pretty good suggestions to uh, the creating habits in an organization. And it fits in line with the thing I had up front, which is how do you really do problem solving in small experiments? And then the book, The Power of Habit, says you really do need to identify your routines. You experiment with rewards. You isolate the cues and have a plan. The whole story here is that it fits in line with actually experimenting your way to figuring out what the problems are. Start small and uh, create an organization that's capable of doing the real true problem solving needed to fix your product development process. So in conclusion, um, I think that we have to make sure that our approach to lean product development is from a problem solving perspective. And there are several reasons for that. One is because if I go back to the chart um, of Steven Spears, ultimately you really want three things overall. You want everybody to be solving problems every single day, all completely aligned with each other. And you really do need to think about uh, the second piece, which is, is your value stream completely and always exposing problems? And the third piece is, are your managers really developing good problem solving capability? That applies to every part of the organization and it really makes a lot of sense in product development. So in order to do that, once again, if you can define your performance problem at the point of delivery, at the output of your product development value stream as it's delivered to manufacturing, and keep a focus on that. Find out what the problem is and say, that's the thing I'm gonna fix and measure it and see if you're making improvements. The second part is then identify inside the product development where you might begin to run experiments on fixing that delivery problem. And again, as I suggested before, maybe there is, you have one team doing fast cycles of learning and you have another team paying attention to your engineering change request system and very carefully try and figure out what are the root cause problems that got you there in the first place and begin to grow problem solving capability there. The second part is build these new habits, start small, realize the benefits, grow effective problem solving capabilities in other areas of and then and allow it to grow uh, kind of from within rather than impose it from above. Focus problem solving simultaneously on the product and also the product value stream improvement. Try to get all of your engineering managers and engineers focused on two things at once. Not just the product itself, but the way they are going about trying to get those questions answered. Is it effective and is it fast? And then finally use some form of learning cycle, whether it be Lambda or PDCA, nested uh, throughout your entire organization so that you are building the muscle for continuous problem solving. You can't do it without these reflection sessions and feedback. In fact, that's one thing Agile does do very well is it has uh, sessions for uh, retrospectives that if done correctly will feed back to you about how to improve the process the next time better than you've done it in the past. So with that, any questions and or reflections? We have a few minutes left. Hi, Jim. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I certainly can. Okay, great. So I do have a question. Uh, the question is, what is the most common barrier you have experienced with organizations uh, in developing these habits? This, yeah, so that, that's a very good question. What I have noticed and actually just got some feedback from a lot of lean people. I'm going to talk about it from a lean perspective, first of all, in terms of uh, its effectiveness and how long it's going to last. And what I'm hearing from that group, lean practitioners and uh, consultants and coaches, is that the major problem is that uh, 
there's something changes that uh, moves them away from an approach toward building this kind of capability in the or organization. It can be some economic condition that might put the company in jeopardy and they have to focus on getting cost out. Uh, it could be that there is a change in management. So there are those kinds of things that get in the way of a good lean transformation. And I think that uh, that's one part. The second thing I want to talk about is that I think a top-down approach and an approach toward uh, applying these principles, a little bit like the Shingo discussion I had, is really kind of, um, it is not going to really build that capability. It's just one more thing to do. And I think that's a very, very significant problem. I was in a company uh, about two months ago, and they showed me their lean product development process. And it was, they took the six principles, five or six principles of our award, and they expanded it into 11. And they put it on a chart, and they decided to measure all of the departments in terms of how well they were following those 11 principles. Now, if you're an engineer, trying to get a product developed. That's just another thing you've got to do is tell people how you're applying all of your thinking to this new model. And it creates resistance. So I think those are the kinds of things that happen in companies that make this not work so well. If, on the other hand, you could take this problem-solving approach and get everybody to think about very specific problems to solve at the output of the delivery of the value stream, it, it becomes more real to them and they can get more aligned with making this happen. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so we do have time for one uh, additional question and we just so happen to have one additional question. How do you tie together creating habits with creating knowledge? Yeah, so it is really the habit of creating knowledge uh, that we've got to build. And again, back to Catherine's presentation, on fast cycles of learning, she's got some really good ideas on very specifically how to do that. It, we are not in the habit of uh, focusing on questions or focusing on answering questions quickly and capturing those questions as she described. That's a habit that does need to be formed inside product development in the upfront phase and it should be done concurrently. 